On episode 630 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Nicole Levina and discuss her book, Sugarless, a seven-step plan to uncover hidden sugars, curb your cravings, and conquer your addiction. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 630. Have you decided you're ready to make a change to reclaim your health and fitness? The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. Each week, we dive deep into health and fitness topics that affect those of us over 40. I'm Coach Allen. I'm an NASM certified personal trainer with specializations in corrective exercise, behavior change, performance enhancement, and fitness nutrition. A Precision Nutrition Level 1 coach, a FAI certified functional aging specialist, and an OTA Level 2 online trainer. Each week, I'm joined by our co-host, Coach Rachel. She is an NASM certified personal trainer and a RRCA level one run coach. Let us be your coaches as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Today, we're talking about sugar addiction. This is an important topic because sweets, junk food, and snacking is often cited as the main reason people struggle to lose weight and keep it off. If you're struggling with sugar, I strongly suggest you listen to this episode. But if you're really serious about making something happen, not just read, listen, and talk about it, then I'd like you to join us at the 10,000 Club. This is a community of like-minded people all looking to lose weight and improve our health. And it's free to join. Learn more at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash club. Get the support and accountability you need to kick the sugar habit for good. 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash club. Hey, Raz, how are you? Good, Alan. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I've been a little busy. Yeah, busy. <laughs> I say that every time, don't I? I say I'm busy right? a lot, don't I? Well, <laughs> You've got a lot going on. <laughs> Yeah, my my mother my mother uh, got diagnosed with um, advanced or late stage uh, COPD, oh, no. and so she's she's now at a point where um, we're we're making some hard decisions and hard things, and and so I had to come back to the states. We went back to the states for about a week. Uh, mm-hmm. That's why we, you know, we're, well, you know, people, we don't record these every week and we don't record them as the like they go live. We record them sometimes weeks in advance, and that's why I had to cancel last week was. I just had a lot of things I had to take care of. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, I've also started a kind of a press trying to get on other podcasts, you know, spread, mm-hmm. the, spread the word. And I've, sure. I've actually been on a couple or I've been on a, a, a podcast and an article. Um, the podcast is called uh, KAJ or cash masterclass. And uh, it was interviewed by a guy named Ajay and it, it was a pretty good interview. Uh, he's really popular in India. So if you haven't heard of him, it's only because you, you you're not in India, uh, probably. <laughs> but I was on his podcast. If you go to forty plus fitness dot com forward slash k a j, uh, you can listen to that podcast. And um, I was also recently featured on a CNN article in CNN Health about hiring a personal trainer. Yes, I saw that. That was yeah. awesome. And I feel really good. Yeah, I was really proud of that of that. Uh, interview and and the results for that article. She did a really, really good job. And uh, so, you know, that's most of what I've been up to, but of course, just doing my coaching, I have onboarded a couple more clients as I went into my enrollment Um, Mm -hmm. and just, yeah, just that and going through and getting everything else done. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. That's really awesome. How are things up there? cold <laughs> still we had a really great uh false spring we had a really nice 50 degree weather melted all the snow that we had had um but it's about to get cold again so real winter's about to show up so we're still still making it through the cold season waiting for the sun to rise again well you know <laughs> poncho tilly phil saw his um shadow so that means you only got yeah. about four more weeks so yep i'm counting down fight down and grit <laughs> <laughs> right exactly <laughs> Yeah, right. looking forward to spring. Well, are you ready to talk about sugar? Sure. Our guest today is a pioneering research neuroscientist 
author and expert in the field of nutrition, diet, and addiction. She is the author of more than 100 scholarly journal articles and the first in the field to study sugar addiction in the laboratory. She has written several books on nutrition and diet, including What You Eat When You're Pregnant and Why Diets Fail. She's received a PhD in neuroscience and psychology from Princeton University, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in molecular biology at the Rockefeller University in New York City. She has regularly appeared on TV and radio, including The Dr. Oz Show, The Doctors, Jonathan Van Ness's Getting Curious, and CNN. She speaks at universities and government agencies and special interest groups about her research. She is also a frequent contributor to psychologytoday.com and Mind Body Green. With no further ado, here's Dr. Nicole Avina. Dr. Avina, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Oh, thanks. Happy to be here. So your book is called Sugarless, a seven-step plan to uncover hidden sugars, curb your cravings, and conquer your addiction. And the thing that's really interesting about this was uh, when, when I first started working coaching people, it became evident that sugar was the culprit almost all the time. Alcohol, it, it, it was in the top three. Uh, and, you know, then it was just the, just overeating where they just were mindlessly eating everything processed. Uh, but sugar comes up time and time again. So I started running sugar challenges. And the big part of the challenge at first was just to realize how much sugar we eat, because I said, you know, the the, the uh, World Health Organization says you shouldn't have more than say 25 grams of added sugar per day. But I don't think till people stop and actually start paying attention, um, that's not even a whole Coca Cola. Um, you know, uh, and so uh, I think it was, you know, it's a good wake up call. But this book was also so. That's what I want to thank you for writing this book, because I do think that this is a big health problem that's being way overlooked across the board. Well, thank you. Yes, I agree. I think, you know, it's something that most people are kind of blind to in some ways because sugar intake and excessive consumption of it, it's become so normalized by our food industry, by just society in general. And so I think it isn't really until people stop and really take a look at how much sugar they're eating that they start to see that, you know, it's very easy to consume way more than you want to just by, you know, going throughout the day and eating like a normal person would eat. So it is a challenge for a lot of people. Yeah. I, you know, just simple stuff. Like you wouldn't think that a pasta sauce would have that much sugar in it, uh, but it does. Uh, ketchup is just almost like liquid sugar, uh, soft yeah. drinks. Um, you know, the mayor of, I think it was the mayor of New York was trying to get large soft drinks banned in the city because you would get, you know, four times the amount of sugar that you, you needed for the day in one soft drink. <laughs> and they think of it as one serving, even though it's a 44 ounce soda, it's, right. it's, it's kind of bizarre how all the places that sugar finds itself these days. <laughs> Yeah, it is. You know, one of the fun things that I had done when I was doing the research for the book was to really kind of dig into some of these odd and strange places where you find added sugar where you wouldn't expect to see it. And one that really stuck out for me was English muffins, which, you know, again, you don't really need sugar, right, in them. They're not sweet but still they have added sugar. And what I discovered is that a lot of times sugar is added to products, yes, to make them taste sweet and to enhance the palatability, but it's also a good masking agent. So especially for a lot of our processed foods, you know, there's chemicals, dyes, there's lots of things added to them that don't always taste great. And so if you add a little bit of sugar, that'll cover up those off-putting tastes. So yeah, well, wasn't that nefarious. Take a little bit of sugar with your cough medicine was that what they used to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's in our food supply. And, um, uh, you know, to me, the easiest way to avoid it is to say, okay, I'm just not going to eat anything processed, but that's nearly impossible these days. If you go out for dinner, if you do anything, it's just everywhere. So, uh, let's take just a moment because when we say sugar, and this was one of the things that would often come up, 
when I would be talking to someone is, well, what about fruit? Fruit's healthy. So, you know, do I avoid fruit and, you know, do I count all sugar? Do I just count the added sugar, which now they do put on the labels? Um, is it good sugar, bad sugar? What is all this? <laughs> Yeah, it gets a little complicated. And I think that it's important to talk about the different types of sugars that exist, because when people hear, you know, sugar is bad for you, I think many people just assume that all sugar is bad. I don't believe that. I think that sugar in the form of fruits and some vegetables that contain sugar naturally can actually be a really good thing for us because fruit is packaged with sugar, yes, but it's not added sugar. It's sugar that is naturally there. And it also contains fiber and other nutrients that are beneficial to our health. So I really think that sugar can be detrimental when it's added sugar. And so that's really what the focus of the book is and, and talking about cutting back on added sugar. Now, again, there are some caveats to that because you know, fruit juice, for example, is not something that I would recommend as being, you know, a quote unquote good sugar, because when you juice a fruit, you're basically just sucking all the sugar out and drinking that and you're throwing away the fiber and lots of the other nutrients. So I really put fruit juice in the category with other sugar sweetened beverages and sodas and things like that. And I don't really think that that's a good type of sugar to be consuming. But, you know, I, again, there are some people who think you have to cut out like fruit from your diet. I really have never met anybody who is overweight or has cardiovascular disease because they're eating too many bananas. It's because they're eating too much processed food. And so the part of our diet that's causing the issues that we're seeing these days when it comes to, you know, our physical health, mental health and all these medical complications that are rising is really from the processed food and that sugar that is added to those processed foods. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. You put label in, you put two labels side by side in the book and one of them was baby carrots. And I forget what the other thing was, but you would just sit there and you look at it and say, well, there's sugar here and you know, it's fewer calories, but here's a carrot. And now it's got all these nutrients. Whereas this other thing is, it's got all these ingredients, but there's like no nutritional value whatsoever, but the carrot does have nutritional value. Um, I agree with you. If, it, if this has fiber and it's going to slow digestion, it's going to slow the sugar hitting your system. It's an entirely different thing. And it was funny because it was a bag of carrots and I could say, I try to say like, don't, don't, if it's in a bag box jar or can, it might not be food. That's just a, you, you should throw up red flags and think about what's in here. If they have to put a label on it, you, you probably want to know why. And if they put it in a bag box jar or can, there's going to be a label. So just take a minute to look at it. But baby carrots, that was the only ingredient in baby carrots. But you could be back there buying bacon and think this is just bacon and not realize it got, it, you know, sometimes it has six grams of sugar in a serving of bacon. And you're like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. And you're so right about, you know, the fact that many of the processed foods that we have are just combinations of ingredients that I also question whether or not we should be calling those things food. You know, we, we, I talk about this in the book, you know, we kind of have this umbrella term of food and we all have this belief that food is good for us and we need food to survive. And I agree that we need some food to survive. We don't need all of the things that are now being considered as food. And so, you know, when people push back on this whole idea that, you know, food could be addictive, because the premise of the book is really about our research on how sugar can meet the criteria for addiction. One of the pieces of pushback that I will get is that, well, how could you be addicted to food? You need food to survive. And my answer to that is always, well, no, I don't think you do need all these different processed foods to survive. I think we need foods that are good for us, but you don't need cookies and, you know, cake to survive. You could live without that. Yeah. So it's really, it's important to, I think, get into the semantics, right? Because it matters in terms of, you know, what kinds of changes, what kinds of education we're going to see happening regarding this issue. But I, I, I'd love to see a whole separate category for processed food. I think it should be called something else. I don't think it should be called food. 
Yeah. Well, it's generally accepted as safe, right? Um, <laughs> generally regarded as safe. Uh, most of these things that we've been eating, and we're probably just now seeing the beginnings of it, you know, as we're getting into a, a true epidemic, you know, when nearly half, I think by 2030, I've heard nearly half of Americans are going to be obese. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And we're, this we're, is not just people over 40. This is no. all Americans. So including the kids, yep. we're getting them obese before they can even be adults. Um, it's It's kind of insane. Yeah. And, and I think that it's one of the unfortunate things that's happening in public health right now, because, you know, it, it's very reminiscent of what happened with tobacco and smoking, where, you know, people were smoking cigarettes in the, you know, 50s, 60s, early part of the 70s, and didn't think anything of it. And everyone was smoking, the doctors were smoking, the dentists were smoking. And it wasn't until we saw the health related effects of tobacco use unfold that we started to see, wow, well, maybe this stuff isn't good for us. Maybe, you know, we need to do some, uh, something to regulate it, something to warn people about the dangers, but it took a while. It took like 50 years to get yeah. that far. So I, I think that that's sort of what's happening now with sugar and processed food. I think you know, we just, like you said, it's generally recognized as safe because it's in the grocery store. And most Americans think that it wouldn't be allowed to be sold to us if it wasn't safe and healthy. But the reality is, you know, if you eat these things day in and day out, we're now seeing, yeah, they are directly linked to all of these medical conditions that are, you know, lifestyle related in some way or another. Now, a lot of people will will step out and say, okay, well, okay, added sugar is terrible, but I, I still want my cookies. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so they'll, they'll, or they still want their soda or whatever they want, uh, their coffee, they want sweetener in their coffee. And so they go to these, these alternatives, alternative sweeteners. Mm -hmm. What, what can you tell us about the alternative sweeteners out there? Well, this is an important question. So it depends on your goal, right? So the alternative sweeteners are still going to affect your brain in a way that's going to promote this addiction like response because it's not the type of sweetener but it's actually just the sweet taste when it hits your tongue that's what activates this cascade of events that eventually lead to the release of different neurochemicals in the brain that can promote this addiction like response so if your goal is to break your addiction to sugar and get away from added sugar using these artificial sweeteners or these alternative sweeteners isn't really going to do that because it's basically going to prolong the addiction. But I will say that if your goal is to really just start to reduce your added sugar, which is the strategy that I recommend, I don't recommend a cold turkey, you know, give it all up overnight type of approach because that doesn't work for people. The, the majority of people have tried that in and out multiple times in their lifetime and it just never sticks. So I really, in the book, Sugarless suggests a more sustainable approach that involves you know, slowly reducing and removing the added sugar in our diet. And so if you're doing that, some people find that using some of these alternative sweeteners can be a crutch. It can help them to you know, get away from added sugar. But I think the goal overall needs to be to reduce our dependence on sweeteners. You know, we don't need to have five sugars in our coffee or five types of sweetener in our coffee. We don't need all this stuff in the cereals. You know, you, we have to just get ourselves back to a situation where we're not so reliant on everything being so overly sweetened all the time. Yeah, I, I remember being a kid and we would get strawberries and we would put sugar on our strawberries. I don't know why we did that, but we put sugar on our strawberries. And now if you actually get your sugars down, you're eating a lot less sugar, you you, you taste the sweetness. I can taste yeah. the sweetness in a carrot. I can taste the sweetness in a strawberry. I know there's sugar in there because I can taste it. But I just look back and say, as a kid, what, I don't even know what I was thinking. I mean, I, I'm a kid, so it didn't really matter. But um, it, it was just that, that weird, weird thing there's a reason for us to have this cravings. There's a reason for us to have this feeling uh, because during a particular time of the season, when, when fruits would be in season and we're walking around, you know, we're foraging and all of a sudden, boom, we walk up on a patch of uh, blueberries or blackberries. 
we're, we're going to eat them all. <laughs> They're only going to be there for two or three weeks. We know that. So we're just going to start eating them and we're going to love them and we're going to want more. So we'll just keep going back and eating as much of them as we can. Part of that is so we can put on some body fat as we get ready to go into winter. Cause when it rolls around winter time, we're not going to have those things, you know, the way it used to be, but now you, you know, <laughs> you made a joke in the book that, uh, what is it? Uh, there's no such thing as a pop tart tree. Um, so we're not going to wander up it's, but it's everywhere. You know, you walk into the grocery store and, uh, 95% of what's in the grocery store is processed and highly processed. It can sit on that shelf for weeks and months. Um, this is the first time in history that humans have had to deal with that abundance of calories and sugar. So easy. <laughs> it's, it's a whole grocery store full of it. Um, so you, we use the term addiction and I think there's people that will say, yes, I'm, I'm definitely addicted to sugar and then other people that will say, well, no, I, you know, I'm not addicted. I could, I can quit anytime, <laughs> you know? Um, and maybe they do, they cut back for a while and then they're, they're back on it and then they're off. How can we, how can we know that th th this is truly an addiction? Cause it's, you know, basically I know that the, um, the medical establishment psych psychiatry, particularly they put together things to, to classify, you know, okay, this is, this is this syndrome. This is that. Um, there, you said there's 11 criteria in the book. Can you kind of just briefly go over those so that we could recognize when we might be in trouble? Yeah. So when we first started doing research on this topic, and this is going back over 20 years now, one of the things that we wanted to be very careful about in the laboratory was to make sure that we were clearly defining what an addiction was. And so we use the criteria that the American Psychiatric Association uses to define what's considered to be addiction to drugs and alcohol, so substance use disorder. And so there are a variety of different criteria. You don't need to meet all of them to be considered as having an addiction. There's a spectrum of addiction. You can have a mild addiction. You can have a, a, a stronger addiction. You could be somewhere in the middle. You even could have pre-addiction now. And so there's really a spectrum where people can fall when it comes to you know, how severe this could be for them. And so some of the criteria are things like binging, consuming more than you intended at a given moment, or experiencing intense desire or craving to get at the substance when you don't have it available, or spending an exorbitant amount of time thinking about the substance or planning how you're going to use it. Also things like withdrawal. Withdrawal is a symptom that can emerge in response to different drugs and in response to alcohol. And we also see that it can actually re happen in response to sugar when sugar is not available. I think most people can relate to the withdrawal component, especially around this time when maybe the New Year's resolutions have officially you know, fallen to the wayside and people were doing well with maybe eating healthy and cutting back on the junk food and the processed food. But one of the big issues that people often face is that they get a little irritable and crabby and, and a little lethargic. And a lot of times people think that's because their blood sugar is dropping. And I've had so many people say, oh, I had to eat some cake because I my sugar was dropping. I was getting like, you know, irritable and crabby. Well, it's actually not your blood sugar. It's the withdrawal. That's what withdrawal looks like in many cases when people have been overeating sugar and then they go off of it. And so another thing would be um, social factors. Now, this is the one that is a little bit different when it comes to food, because a lot of what we have in terms of defining whether or not something's addictive has to do with our social construction of it. And so, for example, you know, it's not all that common for people to be, you know, using drugs like cocaine because you get arrested if you get caught, right? And people just don't like to be around people doing that because it's a taboo thing in our society. There's, you know, laws in place around it. Whereas, you know, tobacco is a little bit less there. I mean, yes, there's regulations. You're not allowed to smoke in certain places and it's sort of looked down upon, but you're not going to get arrested or, you know, charged with a crime if you're smoking a cigarette. Um, and then when we come to food, there's no rules. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's actually welcomed if you bring sugar to someone's house or if you go to an event and, you know, show up with a sweet treat. 
And so the sugar yeah, dealers and the sugar dealers can sit there right on the right on the exit as you're walking out of the grocery store and sell you cookies. Um, yeah. they do it every year. It's <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. The, I know the dealers you're talking about. Those little <laughs> dealers are are troublemakers. But um, and it's not even just them. It's you know, even if you go, I noticed this the other day. I had to make a return to something I bought off of Amazon and at least where I live, you have to go to Staples now to drop it off. So it's, you know, it's a, a store that sells office supplies and mailing supplies. But when you go to the counter to check out, there's like a wall of candy and junk food. And it just doesn't make any sense to me that, you know, why are they selling this here? And it's, it seems like it's just everywhere now. I mean, even, you know, you expect to see that stuff in the grocery store, but why do you need like candy bars when you're trying to mail something or make photocopies? Well, I, you know, I, I think I know why. I had a I had a, a client I was working with, and I had told them to take pictures of everything that they eat because I wanted them to have a, an awareness and stop the mindless eating. That was that was what they were going through. They're like, I'll eat things and not know that I ate them right. until I see the empty wrappers or something, and then I know I ate that. Now I remember eating it, but I didn't think about eating when I was eating it. And so we were talking through it and they're like, you know, I just started paying attention. And, you know, my boss's secretary has a candy jar. And every time I go by her desk, I grab a couple pieces of candy. And so for the first week, he, he was realizing he was taking pictures of those candies. I would like two or three times a day, he would stop by his secretary's his boss's secretary's desk and, and start eating candy. And, and it was, it, then that was just sort of the thing uh, as having candy on your desk for people. And, and, and so, and again, it, I think it's just that, that concept uh, of, yeah, this is something that belongs in your office. It, it's normalizing it in a sense. Yes. You're in an office supply place. The people who are in office supply buy office supplies are typically going to have a desk somewhere. And why wouldn't you have a candy jar there for people? You're just a nice yeah. coworker. Um, pushing your product on <laughs> unsuspecting coworkers. Yeah, no, you're probably right. Um, I just, yeah, it, it's just, again, it, it kind of gets back to the whole idea that we still carry with us that, you know, sugar is associated with affection and love. And I think this comes from times during which sugar was scarce, like in the Victorian era, for example, people had mm -hmm. sugar a few times a year, right? Because it was, it was a, a very scarce thing and we didn't have abundance of it. Right. And so like, I know that from just watching some documentaries around that era with respect to food, you know, it wasn't uncommon for children to be given a piece of fruit, like an orange for Christmas as a gift, as a way to show affection, because, you know, it's so nice to have this sweet fruit and it's something that is a special treat, but, we still have that whole idea that, you know, if you give somebody candy, it means you love them or you're, or you care for them. But now the reality is if you give somebody candy, that means you don't like them and that you hope that they get sick because that's what's happening when you give somebody candy these days, because they're already getting sugar and plenty of it before they come anywhere near you or your candy dish. And so again, we have these sort of old conceptions around what sugar means, but they don't fit in the narrative of what's really happening today. Yeah. It, it'd be the equivalent of uh, the Christmas stocking and you just put cigarettes in there. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, you, you wouldn't do that, but you throw candy in there and voila, there's the stuffed um, stocking for the kids. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I have little kids, so I can relate to this on like a, personal level too, as well as somebody who's, you know, doing this professionally in the field, every holiday has now become a celebration, which is great. I, I think it's great that we do fun things with the kids and we, we celebrate all this stuff. But it, I also have noticed that it's become a food centric thing. Like for instance, you know, February has Valentine's day in March, you know, we'll have St. Patrick's day. I mean, so it's become a thing now where, you know, it's not just handing out the Valentines, it's also handing out like, you know, Valentine's candies or sweet treats. Like there's always a 
food tied to it now. Yeah. Even with St. Patrick's Day, the leprechaun has to leave gold coins that are made of chocolate. Like, <laughs> I don't know why he, he decided he needed to do that, but he doesn't. <laughs> well, someone in some marketing department came up with the idea of wrapping these little chocolates in, you know, gold colored foil and yes, we'll sell millions of them. Yep. So, okay. Now, if someone does believe, okay, because of some of the criteria we just went through that they, they have a, a an addiction, a true addiction. Um, I think you said it, you can't just, we shouldn't just think you can just stop. Like, I'm just going to not eat sugar after today, no added sugar. Um, you'll be healthier if you could, but most of us right. need something that's a little bit more gradual so we can get through this and, uh, in a sustainable way. Um, so you have seven steps in your program, uh, mm -hmm. to, to get off of the sugar, at least, or at least lower it to a healthier level. Uh, could you just briefly go over those seven steps? Yeah. So I really do think that taking a stepwise approach is what's going to help the most people, because I think that over the years, you know, in doing this work, I've talked with a lot of people who've personally struggled with a sugar addiction and many times they do try to go cold turkey and just abruptly quit. Because if you think about it, you know, when something's addictive, usually that's what you do, right? You just, okay, I, I'm addicted to alcohol. I just got a DWI. So I have to stop drinking. I, I have to cut it out of my life. That's the response that mostly we would have. Same with cocaine, morphine, nicotine, you know, those types of things. You just abruptly quit. But I think sugar's different because it is so pervasive in our society. It's hidden in so many things. So could you imagine if, you know, you were an alcoholic and there was alcohol hidden in all the sauces that you were consuming when you're eating pasta or, you know, it was hidden in your breakfast cereal and you didn't know it. I mean, that would be terrible. So I think that a more realistic approach and a more forgiving approach so that we don't feel like we failed if we end up eating something with sugar in it and having that sort of dichotomous thinking is really to have these steps to help people to, first of all, admit that there is an addiction component to this, because I think that that's important. The first step is really, you know, asking yourself, are you addicted? And I have a quiz in the book that helps people to work through that. A lot of people like that and think, wow, okay, I'm addicted. That makes total sense. This is why I feel this way. Thank you for, you know, validating my feelings. Other people have to kind of think about it for a bit because they don't necessarily want to label themselves as an addiction, right? Because it's a loaded term and it means a lot to a lot of different people. So feeling out where you are in terms of the addiction is certainly the first step. And Regardless of how you feel about that term, you know, understanding how sugar affects your brain and causes these changes in your behavior is important because that's how addictions work. They okay? hijack the brain and cause us to behave in ways where we don't really have control. So beyond that, the steps after that really involve systematically dealing with sugar in our modern food environment. So identifying where the hidden sugars are, that's a big step. Going through your pantry, going through your refrigerator, looking at the menus to the restaurants that you like to go to, and really just kind of figuring out, okay, what are the things I like? Where's the sugar? <laughs> Which one has sugar? You know, how much of it? And what kinds of alterations could I make so that I don't have to give up that product? I don't have to give up eating it or getting that if I go to a restaurant, but I can tweak it so that it's not going to have as much added sugar. And so that's really the goal is again, you know, systematically working through your diet to eventually get the sugar down to as low as you possibly can. And then other steps work on dealing with the cravings. That's a big one for a lot of people because, you know, again, we are in a society that's constantly promoting sugar to us. It's being pushed on us. There's advertisements everywhere. And so, of course, people are going to struggle with cravings because, they're being primed by ads or by people, you know, offering them different types of things to eat that maybe have sugar in them. If they're trying to avoid that, then it can be an awkward conversation. So I talked through how to deal with sugar pushers, how to beat cravings, how to really not change your life, but change your immediate environment so that you're not so 
impacted by added sugar. And it really does boil down to just making a lot of small changes that over time add up to really big effects. Yeah. I had um, a guest on Brian King and he he was telling a story about Krispy Kreme and uh, he, he talked about how his, you know, amygdala just turned on. And while he was in his head ne negotiating about donuts, because he knew it was on that road and he was getting close to it, he found himself in the parking lot and he, he really couldn't go back and figure out when he made the turn and, and his body was sitting in a parking. Now he was sitting in a parking lot and he had been negotiating with himself that, okay, I'll just get one donut. And then, you know, his, his adult brain is like, no, <laughs> you won't just get one donut. When you walk in there, you're going to get at least six. And, yeah. and then you're not just going to eat one because they're going to be sitting in the car seat right next to you for the rest of the drive. You're going to eat all of them. And so he managed to pull out of that, um, out of that parking lot and leave. But when he drove back through the next time he stopped. And so definitely signals that there's an addiction going on there and understanding that behavior, not beating yourself up for it, but just finding other ways to basically make better choices, um, knowing, okay, the, how much sugar is in, in, in that Krispy Kreme, how many is in six, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so maybe having a Krispy Kreme every once in a while, isn't a problem if you can truly not buy all six of them and eat them all right there. Um, doctor, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Well, you know, I think that it's about the journey. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for me personally, I, I try when I get up every morning, it's a new day. And I really just try to make decisions and do things that are going to support my health. So again, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. You know, everybody has their thing once in a while that they do, but it's more about really just overall trying to do what you can to support your health and be as healthy as you can. So I think for me, number one is getting some sort of movement every day. I like to go to the gym a couple of days a week because I have friends there. I like the trainer. Um, it's like a social thing for me. So going to the gym a couple of days a week. And if I don't go to the gym, then I either work out at home or sometimes I just walk my dog and take them, you know, walk around town and, and just get movement, get something physical especially because most of us have very sedentary jobs and, and lifestyles these days. Um, the second thing is, you know, with nutrition, it's really, like I said, small changes, making small changes to better your health. And there, I think it's really important to, you know, focus on what you can do and not focus on the things that maybe you did <laughs> that you regret, like eating all that ice cream the other night or something like that. Um, and then the last thing I think, you know, and this is what I've been thinking about a lot more lately is working to reduce stress. I, you know, we all have stressors, but I think we have more stressors these days than we used to because we're constantly being stimulated by emails and text messages and all this stuff to do. And, you know, we just have a lot of access to a lot of things, but I think a lot of people get internalized stress as a result and high stress jobs. And, you know, there's just a lot going on. And so I really think it's important that we keep our stress in check and step away. I know that for me, you know, I I'm very busy and I have a family and, you know, lots of responsibilities. And so I make it a purpose to really just kind of step back when I start to feel like overwhelmed and just, you know, do something else, walk, go for a walk or, you know, go get coffee with a friend or something to just de-stress and detach. Cause I think that the stress is after the, our diet, I think the stress is the second thing that's really contributing to the problems we're having physically and with mental health these days. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Avina, if someone wanted to learn more about you and learn more about the book, Sugarless, where would you like for me to send them? Yeah. So if you want to learn more about the work that we're doing and about um, 
different things related to food and nutrition, definitely check out my website. It's drnicolavina.com. And you can also follow me on social media and that's at Dr. Nicole Avina. And the book Sugar List is available wherever books are sold. It's in Barnes and Nobles. You can also find it on Amazon. It's in um, local bookstores. So definitely check it out. There's lots of great tips in there from the psychology perspective, but also from you know the addiction science perspective. And there's also 30 sugar-free recipes that are included to help you get started. Right. Uh, you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 630, and I'll be sure to have those links there. Dr. Vina, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you. Welcome back, Raj. Hey, Ellen. That was a great interview. You know, I always love when we talk about sugar and what what evil it is. And so it's interesting to have um, an author discuss it, especially from the point of view of it being an addiction. Like we talk about that all the time, but I, you know, it didn't, didn't really realize how serious it, it really is as an addiction. Well, she is, she is the, uh, the, the person that ran the studies that mm -hmm. first explored sugar addiction. That's amazing. In fact, when she went through, um, you know, you, when you go for your doctorate, you have to go forward with a thesis. So it basically mm -hmm. drives most of what you do as you're working through your doctorate. And so she, her initial thesis, when she sat with, down with her advisor was, uh, is sugar addictive. Mm -hmm. And so the first step they have to do, apparently when they're going to go through their thesis is say, okay, I got to go back and I've got to research everything that's been done on this. Now this was 23 years ago, but she went through, there was nothing. That's crazy to like me. Nothing on sugar addiction at all, like nothing. And so she, uh, she went back thinking she had failed, that she had picked a bad thesis and she went back to her advisor and he's like, no, I think, I think you got something here. Mm. And he encouraged her to move forward with that thesis. And so she did a lot of, uh, feeding sugar to mice and watching what <laughs> happened. Oh uh, gosh. And, and so that was her, yeah, that was what she did when she started out. She started the initial science around rather sugar was addictive. And, you know, mm -hmm. the evidence is there, what it fires in your brain, how it works, what it does. Mm -hmm. It's all there. And unfortunately, you know, we're still somewhat driven by this calories in calories out model, the low mm -hmm. fat model, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. if a, a gram of fat is x uh, nine calories, and a gram of uh, sugar is four, Mm -hmm. then the calories out in calories out model would say it's cool to swap a gram of sugar with a gram of fat. Right. And what that does is it creates, yes, it, it, you almost have to be sugar because it, you want to make it palatable. You take all the fat out of something and it it's terrible. Mm -hmm. right. So you put the sugar in there mm -hmm. and makes it palatable and then it gets into everything. Mm -hmm. And then there's more of it added to other stuff, even stuff that doesn't need to be sweet or isn't really so sweet at all from our, mm -hmm. our current palate. Um, it's in there too. That's so crazy. And, uh, and that's just been the adaptation from getting away from fat and trying to, mm -hmm. because that's something sugar self, shelf, sugar is self shelf stable. So right. I can make something with sugar and it can sit on the shelf for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And if I yep. package it up with fats that can sit on the shelf, a little bit of fat that can sit on the shelf for a long, long time, then I have the perfect product uh, mm -hmm. if it tastes good. Mm -hmm. um, and then our body eats it and we're like, okay, uh, I just had these, these, you said earlier, we were talking snack well cookies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And our body tells us, cause we just ate three of those things. You know, we're looking mm -hmm. at it. It's okay. It's only 50 calories each. So yeah, I'll eat three of these. Mm -hmm. And then your body didn't get the nutrition it wanted. Right. And so it says, Hey, Rachel, mm -hmm. give me some more of that. That was nice. Another sleeve yeah. of cookies. Give me some, <laughs> and then like your three more, three more <laughs> cookies, mm -hmm. another 150 calories. Mm -hmm. And so if you just ate cookies with some healthy fat in it, then mm -hmm. you would have gotten what your body needed. And it would have said, okay, I'm done at maybe what was 250, but mm -hmm. now you've eaten 300. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, right. <laughs> and then your blood sugar goes down again later because insulin kicks in and it's just this cycle and it, and it's, it's also in the brain. So there's the dopamine effect of, ah, you know, I feel good. So you have trigger eating cookies, 
mm-hmm. the action of eating the cookies mm-hmm. and then the dopamine hit is the reward. Oh yeah. And, and so you see a pack of cookies in a package and you're immediately imagining what they taste like. <laughs> yep. You know, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> and that's not even it. You know, when I think of sugar, sugar lists or sugar free, like the title of our book, sugar lists, you know, I'm thinking like candy bars, right. That we have our afternoon snack as a handful of M&Ms from the office stand or a candy bar from the vending machine or something. So when I think sugar, I'm thinking straight up candy, you know, but it's in all of our food. It's in everywhere. It's, it's actually hidden in so many foods. Like you don't think that it's in tomato sauces. So when I make a batch of chili, I'm watching the type of tomatoes that I put in the sauce or it's in salsas in yogurt. I mean, everybody yeah. thinks yogurt is a health food, but if you really look at the label and see how much sugar is in some of these yogurts, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Box, bag, jar, <laughs> or can. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, yeah. It's not that it has to be in there. It's it just, it usually is. And so mm-hmm. if you're trying to avoid sugar, you're much better off. It's easier to just say, don't eat anything that comes from a box, bag, jar, can. And if you were going to, because we will mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. read the label, right. um, they, they have to put in the United States, they have to put added sugar on the label now. Um, mm-hmm. So you can just see what would, what if here's a tomato sauce, there's, mm-hmm. there's sugar in, in tomatoes. So th- there will be some sugar in it, even if they right. don't add sugar. So you can, maybe the label says on the front, no sugar added. There may still be sugar in it, but that came from the tomato. Yeah, which is okay. totally different. <laughs> which is totally different. Um, but the whole point being is, yes, they they add it in there and uh, they sell more sauce, um, mm-hmm. but it's in a jar or a yeah. can. And so yeah. that's the whole principle. Uh, they have to make it easy for you to know that it's in there, but they will do everything they can to hide it. So two, two little yeah. tricks. One is the higher up something is listed in the ingredients list, the more of it there is by volume. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they will put some high fructose corn syrup. They might also put some agave nectar or honey or molasses or some other thing that ends in a word os. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a sugar. And so, you know, that's why now they have to put the added sugar. So the point being is when you look at the carb section on the nutrition label, it's going to tell you the total carbs. It's going to tell you the amount of fiber. You subtract the fiber from the total carbs. That basically tells you how much simple carbohydrates are in this. So some mm-hmm. flours and things like that, uh, basically flour and other simple things like that, they're already broke down. They're going to act just like sugar for the most mm-hmm. part inside our bodies. Mm-hmm. They're going to raise our blood sugar and whatever problems we have in going on metabolically inside, uh, that's going to, you know, that's going to either help or hurt us depending on what we're doing. So you subtract the fiber from the total, you know about how much sugar effect you will, how mm-hmm. high, high in index, gluco, glycemic index that that food is. Uh, and then they break it down a little further. They say added sugar. So mm-hmm. again, you can kind of look at those three numbers in comparison and mm-hmm. say, okay, what, what are the net carbs, which is the, the total carbs minus the fiber. That's my net carbs. How much is added. And then what's the, what's left is just the stuff like flour and other things that are, you know, just mm-hmm. other fruit sugars and things like that, that were in the food. Um, but you can just see, I, I never, I never would have <laughs> added sugar to a, a chili. I, mm-hmm. I don't, but, but if you look at winning chili recipes, mm-hmm. it's, it's unbelievable. I was in a chili cookoff. This guy was like pouring more sugar in there. It was, it, mind blowing. I know he it's, won. A, it's a strange he uh, flavor. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. Won. It's, uh, it's, you know. <laughs> it's a flavor profile, but you know, I like to say, and I, I know you have said it too, if you can measure it, you can monitor it. And so by measuring it, you know, we're, we can start to pay attention to these added sugars that are in the common foods, but you also had a really good strategy or um, I should say this um, doctor of uh, vein had a good strategy as well but to replace like one meal at a time, like to pay attention to what sugar is in each meal, but then to make a healthier option or with a less sugar option. Yeah. Well, that, that was the core of it is, is if you try to do this all at one time, it can be a little overwhelming. 
because, you know, some things are really in your control and some things are not. So you could wake up, you know, you could sit there and look at your breakfast and say, okay, well, I I usually I eat this instant oatmeal. It's organic, Mm -hmm. you know, it's healthy. Well, that's got 25 grams of carbs in it. That's, that's all Mm -hmm. of them. That's if I would only Mm -hmm. let, if I only eat added sugars, 25 grams is what the world health organization recommends for max, max consumption for a day, 25 grams of added sugar. Well, that, that one packet, did you Mm -hmm. really just eat one packet? Right. (laughs) (laughs) So you start looking and say, where's the sugar coming from? And you pull out the Mm -hmm. packet of, of, um, of your, uh, favorite bacon. Mm -hmm. And you look at it. It's like, you know, this is the, you know, this is bacon. It's in a packet, but then you look and you see, okay, it's sugar, Mm -hmm. (laughs) added sugar. And it may only be three grams. But then you look at it and say, well, that's, that's one slice of bacon. Right. Did you just eat one slice of bacon? Not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now eggs are eggs. I mean, unless, mm-hmm. unless you add any sugar to your eggs. Um, I know mm-hmm. some people that do, um, then it's just, it's just eggs. Um, and so that's the whole point is breaking down your breakfast and saying, these are what the things I eat, you know, obviously, you know, cereals, Back, bad wow, box, shark can, uh, yeah. probably going to have some added sugar to it. Um, so then mm-hmm. you start replacing it and saying, okay, well, what's, what's wrong with me just having an omelet with some vegetables um, and a little bit of cheese and mm-hmm. running with that? Uh, Perfect. There's not a lot of sugar in that. Cool. Mm-hmm. I got, I got breakfast nailed down. I'll do these little uh, muffins, these egg muffin things. I know everything that's in it. Uh, mm-hmm. I can make a batch of those and have those, you know, for the next three or four days. Um, I can find a bacon that's not, that has no sugar in it. I can, and so there's things you can do and that's what you mm-hmm. start doing. Once you feel like you've nailed down your breakfast, then you can go focus on dinner. Uh, sure. they want you to start with, she wants you to start with breakfast because it's the easiest meal of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the most control for breakfast and then you go into yeah. dinner. You have a good bit of control for dinner unless can, yeah, you're going to go out and eat. Mm-hmm. Then you've kind of lost a good bit of control there. Um, mm-hmm. I, I wanted, I went to this one place and I said, I'd like some cinnamon for my sweet potato. And they mm-hmm. they brought this thing and it, it had sugar in it. And I says, well, of okay, course. do you have one that's just cinnamon? And they're like, no, well, this is the cinnamon. This is the cinnamon we get. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and you could see the sugar in it. There was enough sugar in the cinnamon to see the sugar. And I mm-hmm. said, well, the sweet potato is already sweet enough. I don't need any sugar. I had to start bringing my own cinnamon when we went out night because it was this place <laughs> for steak. Good strategy. And the sweet potato, I had steak and sweet potato. I was like, okay, I'd start bringing my own. I'd, I'd bring my own butter because their their butter was, it had the, oh, you know, the trans fats honey. in it mm-hmm. and, and honey. And I'm mm-hmm. like, no, I don't want that. And so it was right. just this whole concept of, of rethinking my dinner meals. And then you get the dinner meals done. Then you can focus on lunch. For a lot of us, lunch is more difficult takes a lot more planning than breakfast or dinner would. Um, mm-hmm. And then you get that nailed down and then she saves snacks for last because she's like, you know, most of the time you want a snack that is shelf stable. And mm-hmm. so that means a lot of times like vegetables and fruits, not entirely all that shelf stable if you leave them out for more than a couple of days. Mm-hmm. So if you just want to have something in your desk, you could have some nuts and things like that, but if the candy nuts, they put sugar on nuts. Sugar. And- <laughs> yeah. So, yep. you know, it, it's just one of those, you, you've got to look at what's there and make some choices. But so she just sure. kind of walks you through that process of understanding how addicted you might be. And then all the way through the process of, of then starting to try to eliminate it. Um, she does not believe in the cold Turkey method mm-hmm. uh, of trying to do it. And I can see that it can be very overwhelming if you, sure. if you don't want to just sit there and say, okay, if it didn't walk this earth or grow in the soil, I won't eat it. Um, mm-hmm. that's, you know, okay. It's, it's a good aspiration, but for a lot of people, it's not practical. It's um, a lot. Yeah. So I get it. I, you know, I don't let someone else's standard be your standard, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, if you decide you want to go cold, all Turkey, all in, uh, then it's, you just, you know, it's okay. It's a piece of meat and it's some vegetables and I didn't put mm-hmm. anything else in it other than some spices to make it taste better. Uh, then, then, you know, what's in it. It's good, but it, that's mm-hmm. not the easiest thing to do. Uh, sure. particularly if you're going to like have a life or something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Sugar is everywhere. If we just paid attention to what we were eating and monitor it a little bit more, we can um, cut it out a little at a time and, and be healthier for it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, Raz, I'll, I'll talk to you next week. Take care, Alan. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we bring back Dr. Lynn Lindbergh and discuss recovering from setbacks and overcoming obstacles. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.